Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here today and thank you for the opportunity. I think we're going to take a different tact for the next 20 minutes. We're actually going to go outside of industry uh, and we're going to talk to some of the 10 key elements that are consuming a lot of our conversations at KPMG with both incumbents and startups when it comes to future-proofing businesses towards customer centricity. And obviously in that is how to drive engagement that is digitally fueled as well. Um, so first and foremost, one of the key areas that we spend a lot of our um, time on is clearly customer experience. Now, earlier this morning, there was a lot of conversation and you guys being more so disruptors than incumbents know this all too well. But for those that are incumbents and legacy businesses, UX is still something that is a work in progress uh, piece, of, um, piece of programming. And for us, we're spending a lot of time working on really defining what is the best UX because ultimately it's proven to win in the long run, assuming um, an even playing field. And I think the key thing here is that UX is not a fait accompli, it is not a set and forget, and it's a continuum of continual uh, product development and enhancement and test and learn. And so for us, a lot of our conversations are very much around ensuring businesses are very much focused on this area, but also recognising that the benchmarks are now very much outside of industry and that users and consumers are judging their best experience based on their last best experience. And it doesn't mean anymore that you have to be or should aim to be the best in fin services, but actually the likes of organisations such as these on the screen have really set benchmarks for UX and CX across all categories. All of these brands have played a role in actually determining what our expectations are, even of fintech. And all of these are very true to being highly data-led, being consumer-centric at the core, being fundamentally focused on frictionless commerce, being absolutely ruthless in its product development. And as a result, these brands have now really entered into new markets that otherwise uh, wouldn't have existed. So, for example, Uber naturally has changed all of our behaviour when it comes to transport. But now they are clearly impacting decisioning around dining. Duolingo is now absolutely a benchmark in a lot of our conversations when it comes to content development, content gamification and serving in many industries that are outside of the learning space. So the impact of these people are obviously uh, crucial. And obviously there are examples in the areas of insurance tech, fintech and so on that you guys are well and truly aware of. I mean, if we look at Lemonade, a great example of an organisation that disrupted a very commoditised industry in insurance. But actually, instead of looking at it from a marketer's agenda of the four Ps, it was very much a focus on the new four Ps, which is what at the core is the customer problem that we're looking to solve? How is there an actual proof that there's a market for that? Where is the proof that it can scale? And actually ensuring that there's personality, because that is absolutely crucial in cut through when it comes to digital engagement. And when you look at that, obviously there are examples in this room and obviously in the industry of fintech that are doing a great job already, so we don't need to harp on those. But all of these um, you know, scenarios are very much about leading with digital, leading with data and ensuring that the customer is at the core of the operation. But the key here in all of this is that that doesn't mean it's about creating new digital assets because assets alone don't ensure business results. It's about making sure that you have the most relevant engagement levers and channels and that they've been tried and tested and are actually delivering business results. And so with that in mind, you know, the challenge is often that we've got all seen charts like this in the various industries that we've been um, a part of. This clearly is one on fintech. Standing out in a clutter of this size is one of the biggest challenges. Engagement is absolutely crucial, but sometimes so too is actually cutting through. And this is where digitally fueled marketing is going to be crucial in an era where there's so much choice out there in the market and in the broader ecosystem of fintech. So digital fueled marketing is absolutely key and making sure that it's profitable is absolutely key and where often a lot of startups fall down. We spend a lot of time working with both incumbents and startups in ensuring that any, initial, um, any digital marketing is highly focused around profitability and making sure that the customer lifetime value is in the front and centre of the equation when it comes to scaling, scaling both organically and scaling through partnerships. So that is absolutely key. On top of that is clearly being data-led and highly personalised in that operation. 
And as we grow more and more towards a millennial focus, because they will be the key workforce and generation of the future, making sure that our brands have personality and social purpose are going to be more and more important. And in all of that, obviously, in an era of congressional hearings and data breaches, trust and transparency is first and foremost um, a topical area and an absolute focus uh, moving forward. So the key thing here is, yes, engagement is key, but here we've been talking a lot about scaling and about growing. And at the core of that is obviously making sure that you are as a brand in the moments that matter. And more often than not, this, this is actually um, where the, the challenge is. Uh, customer acquisition is hard, but unintentionally, a lot of brands actually don't go through the detail of recognising what those moments are that really matter in that um, acquisition phase. If we just look at, say, home loans, for example, and we do this kind of mapping for many sectors, an average home loan has about 460 moments that matter to a consumer in its various decisioning around comparison sites, search behaviour, and decisioning and consideration of what brands I want to be working with and then getting to that final end purchase. And the questions we ask many of our clients is, how much detail do you go into in recognising this path in your sector? And are you showing up effectively in those moments that matter or are you not there and your competitor is there? And equally, when you do show up, is that best UX, is that best experience in place for that moment that matters to lead to that conversion. And again, more often than not, the gaps are well and truly there. And that gap has led to clearly a key element of most conversations, and it's a term that's even been used quite um, liberally today, which is customer journeys. But unfortunately, customer journeys have become the new black. Um, everyone's doing them, and as a result, they're absolutely table stakes in terms of operation. And sometimes they're deeply flawed. Um, customer journeys often do not consider the ample uh, amount of work and the moments that matter that were on that earlier slide. Customer journeys tend to start when I have considered your brand, not actually when I'm still in the consideration of which brand to go with. So we do spend a lot of our time working through unpacking journeys that are actually only one equation when they should be considering the whole equation of those moments that matter. Another area that is challenged in customer journeys is that often, and more so in incumbents, they are built and often funded by silos within the business and they don't recognise the interdependencies of a customer's experience with that brand or institution. And in particular, the big four would be a great example. So again, making sure that journeys are operationalised, are highly action-oriented, are absolutely key. And why this is crucial is that journeys on the moan and CX on, the moan, on their own are clearly not the differentiating factor that has been a huge conversation all this morning. We live in such a dynamic world right now and obviously you can see that there's deeply new channels that are developing, there's uh, changing consumer trends and staying on top of that with just CX alone is not enough. You know, how relevant and how ready is our business for the growing gig economy that is absolutely um, taking shape? How focused are we on the growing advice from peers? Now, obviously, peers is a key component to social adoption and referrals. How ready is your business in terms of taking advantage of that? Clearly, you guys have been taking advantage of the fact that loyalty is challenged in big institutional banking. So that is an opportunity. But the reality is that there's also new uh, competitors coming that potentially could challenge your industry. 84% of respondents to surveys suggested that if and when um, the likes of your Apple, Amazon or Google get into the financial servicing provision, that they would be more than likely to consider that. How ready are we for those kind of entries into the market are going to be absolutely key. And as a result, through all of this and the opportunities that come with open banking, access to data and what you do with it are actually going to be the most crucial. And so from our perspective, making sure that we are helping our clients get future-proofed around this is absolutely going to be key. But to do that, it requires a lot more platform thinking versus product thinking. And so spending time on ensuring that new business models have been developed is absolutely crucial. And so when you think about a great brand, um, think of Pepper, of course, and you guys would know this all too well. You know, a bank that's been set up with a mobile-only mindset, seamless um, connectivity, 
uh, onboarding within eight minutes, highly focused around what millennials love most, which is mobile accessibility. And the key here is that they have taken it to a whole new level in terms of adopting mobile best practice. So if you think about their UX commitment, they are as on demand as Uber. They are as instant as, web, um, as uh, WeChat. They're deeply visual like Instagram. They're as contextual as, as Google search. They're as personal as Flipboard. And obviously as social as Facebook and as engaging as our favourite emoticons. So this kind of new terrain in customer experience is absolutely the new norm that we should be striving for. And if that's too high an ambition, as it often is with many of our clients that are more the incumbents, we spend a lot of our time making sure that we recognise that we as consumers are definitely not channels, but interestingly, we're served up as if we are. You know, we certainly do not uh, differentiate between channels, but why is it that most incumbents have an inconsistent experience, be it online, be it web, be it contact centre, be it broker, or be it direct? And so unpicking that and ensuring that there's a commitment that these silos should remain on farms and not in the experience for consumers is absolutely crucial. And as we're working towards that and continually optimising for what we think is absolutely the now, which is mobile, how ready are we for a world of search when it's voice-based or even screenless? You know, 50% of searches will be voice-based by 2020. It's currently just over 20%. And screenless is going to be obviously key. And so your distribution partners in this area, be it Alexa, be it Google, are absolutely going to be vital to ensure that your brand gets cut through. So what that means is that you need to, as a brand, wow me everywhere. Uh, and that means bridging gaps between the channels that exist, not being so fixated on your own channels as being the only distribution mechanism, but actually being where I am as a consumer. And obviously, scenarios such as Messenger and WeChat right now are seen as methods to engage, but not necessarily to transact. But transaction capability is going to be coming and is certainly an expectation of consumers. And I guess what that leads to is at the core is that we as consumers are looking for assistance versus what has historically been exhaustive processes in these sectors. And at this point, I'd like to introduce you to KPMG's view of the future of banking, but it's beyond banking, in fact. It's just the future of financial service provision. And that is Eva, so let's just have a quick look. With some Wake up. Hey, Eva. Good morning. Sleep well? Not bad, thanks. Do with another hour. So I'm going out with Grant tonight. Dinner and drinks. Could be a late one. Don't forget, the last train is at 10.45. You've been spending a lot on taxes lately. Message received. John, it's your dad's birthday next week. Would you like me to pick a few gift ideas to choose from? Uh, yeah, thanks. Something... Nice. Leather bound. You know the sort of thing he likes. I was thinking about 150, 200. Perfect. I see copper took a bit of a battering overnight. Yes. Oil rose 0.5%, so I rebalanced your portfolio. I'll reassess when the market's open. Maybe keep an eye on gold too. I'm on it. Oh, Eva, I got a message from Kate in HR. Something to do with pensions? Already taken care of, John. I've increased your monthly contributions by 3% and transferred £10,000 from your ISA. Great. Thanks. Is there any way I can make more of my investments? My projections suggest you could improve your... Sorry, Eva. Got to run. I'll catch up with you on the train. OK, John. Transferring now. can see Eva is fully digitally enabled and, um, and a full service provision as well. So it talks to the power of not necessarily being a bank per se but being a partnership network of financial freedom. 
And at the core, clearly, is a high level of personalisation, data fueled, a little bit creepy, to be quite honest. Um, but at the same time, certainly giving you the assistance that you're looking for, um, by and large, with a frictionless um, experience at the core. And so, as you can see, we're a long way from delivering on that, but it certainly is in our future, and getting ready for that is going to be key. And again, your distribution networks in that scenario and your partnership networks become ever so crucial. So with that in mind, though, it is still far away, and what we're still um, focused on in terms of conversations with our clients right now is how do I drive more of that self-care and service online? Now, what's happening is that Bots clearly are consuming the conversation. There's lots of tactical conversations around what is the best way to provide self-care. Now, to bot or not to bot, there are plenty of bots out there and they play a very important role. And as long as they are understood in terms of what they do, uh, in terms of answering FAQs and not necessarily really servicing the high value and complex conversations, they're absolutely fine. And managing the connectivity and the choice for a consumer to determine how they want to be serviced is absolutely key. And there's still a lot of work to be done in this area in terms of really having that experience on demand, which the future state of where current bots are will evolve into. And fundamentally at the core of that is that we actually need to ensure that we are creating a community, not just a database of members, customers and prospects. And community is the key to ensure that there's ongoing engagement, ongoing revenue streams and ongoing referrals for scale. And outside of this industry, one of the examples that we often use is House. For those that aren't familiar with it, it's actually a website that is focused on ensuring that you can design your own house. Now, essentially, it could have been um, an e-commerce site on its own, but it has leveraged the power of social and community to ensure that it's a hell of a lot more than that. And as a result, it has 40 million monthly users. So examples like that are key to ensuring that when you're thinking about your customer base, you're thinking about the communities that you are building in that as well. Now, we talked to Speed earlier. Um, there was a conversation around sometimes too fast is not necessarily a good thing. But fundamentally, when it comes to some claims scenarios, maybe that is the case. But fundamentally, consumers are looking for speed and it goes back to this assistive need that they're looking for. And we spend a lot of time focusing on removing that friction for customers. And that can be not only in claims processing or applications, but equally just in basic information provision. If, uh, for example, a, a Google survey suggested that if a site on mobile uh, does not download within three seconds, 53% of people abandon that. That is a really high abandonment rate that interestingly still Australian retailers and many other industries are falling behind in. So a lot of work still needs to be done in that mobile space. And we've talked about the key behind all of this is data. It's to be smart. We're all sitting on quite a bit of data and there's opportunities to naturally leverage further and open banking provides that opportunity even more. But through it all is making sure that it's actionable and insight led. And importantly, it's about making sure that when you're really forensically looking at your customer base, you're not getting caught up in the fallacy of averages, which is unfortunately where a number of firms do focus. It's about being ruthless in segmenting the individual cohorts of customers that exist and being really, really clear on the levers and the channels of effectiveness against those as you're looking to scale your business. It's about leveraging data and leveraging life phases, which are crucial to a lot of uh, financial service decisioning. And clearly, it's about automation as well. So at the core, you can obviously scale organically through effective and digitally fueled marketing. But equally, distribution, partnerships, and monetizing your service delivery, and thinking more like a platform versus a product, and clearly thinking customer first is actually going to be key. So thank you very much. Um, I think we might have time for a question or two. Um, are there any questions from the audience? We probably haven't enough time to actually... Oh, have we got one? Yeah, we yeah. have. Um, please give some examples <laughs> of how much fintech... Oh, of cost of acquiring the customer. Can you read that? It's probably better than I can. I don't think I can um, talk to the specific dollar examples at all. It, I think the key thing here is that um, what we are finding more and more is that we are actually focusing a lot of our energy on um, 
giving guidance not only to fintechs but also to incumbents on what is a profitable way of growing. And so fundamentally a lot of the conversations are about cost on a li customer lifetime basis and cost to a profitable basis versus an aggregate number that would not be terribly appropriate to share. Um, is there any way in which you can reduce the cost of those, that acquisition? Are there any quick fireways, quick shortcuts that I've used Facebook? Um, that allow you to target a much wider group of people? I think the key is the more that you think like a platform and you, you play in the open ecosystem and you partner and you really look at your distribution networks, that is obviously a way that is going to be not as costly as spending a lot of um, dollars on Marcoms that often can not necessarily yield the right customers into your service or product. So leveraging partnerships and clearly just getting forensic around where is the churn taking place across your business and what are the levers that drive that return is always the place to focus. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.